Good morning, friends, and welcome to Meeting House Church. We are so glad you're joining us today. My name is Trev Erickson, and I'm the communications manager here. Before the service begins, I wanted to take a minute to help orient you to worshiping with us online. Check out the description of this stream below where you'll find helpful links for you to get the most out of today's service. You'll find PDFs of our handouts, links to learn more about our community, and even ways to submit prayer requests. And of course, you can always find these things at meetinghouse.church. If you'd like to get more connected in our community, an easy first step is to text CONNECTMC to 55498. As we're getting ready to start this morning, send a message in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. And from all of us here at Meeting House Church, welcome.
welcome brothers and sisters to worship. We've been called here together by our own inclinations, our own desires perhaps, but most importantly by God. And the one thing that I hope that you will leave this place with is the knowledge that God is love. So hear these words from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Please join us as we sing our opening hymn. seated. Thank you, Abby. It's good for us to just pause as we enter the time of prayer and to remember that we are entering the presence of God, a God who spoke creation into being but yet cares about the very issues of our lives, cares about us personally, cares about this world and the things that we care about, which means that as we pray, we can pray in confidence that God hears our prayers And the God of the universe works through the prayers of his people to do the work that he's called to do and we're called to do. So let's pray together. Oh God, in a world that seems to have gone crazy and lost its way, you are a permanent fixture, never changing, same yesterday, today, and tomorrow a confidence that we can have in an ever-ready, ever-present, faithful God. We come to you this morning with open hearts and open minds for the ways that you might lead us. Well, we've come seeking answers and leading and direction and strength, strength for the day ahead, for the days ahead. God, we pray for courage to be the people you call us to be, people who seek justice and peace through your love for all your people. God, we struggle with questions that seem to have no answers and problems that have overwhelming solutions. We acknowledge that we're a deeply divided people, so many thoughts, so many opinions, so many voices. Help us to find your way. Help us to find our way as you lead us. 
God, as we look and listen to people around us, so, so many divided, so many frustrated and disappointed and hurting, help us to come alongside them and encourage them and support them along the way. God, we recognize that there are huge issues going on around the world, and especially those who are caught in war, who are facing the issues of, of all the shortages that war brings. We especially lift up Ukraine this day in the midst of pain and grief and fear. We pray that you would cut through all that divides and bring a peace that is lasting. We lift up the people of Buffalo this morning. Yet another mindless loss of life motivated by hate. Lord, be with the families of yet another city that grieves and help us to be a people who live by peace that you give us and seek the peace that you lead with. Surely we humans test your patience, God. But we know that your love is all-encompassing and it never ends. We know that you are always forgiving and in that is our hope. A hope that brings us a love that is unconditional, but comes with a call. God, you are our hope for this world. It is you and in this hope that we live and move and have our being. We're grateful for this spring season which reminds us that Renewed life can come by your power. We invite you to come and do that in each of our lives, in this church, in this community, and around this world. This morning we lift up those in our congregation who are sick or are hurting or facing surgeries or procedures this week. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with Bruce Moody and Steve Lindsay Jerry Seavers and Eleanor Westerberg, Kay Bokert. Be with the family of George Gackle and Noel Pittman and Jenny Anderson as they grieve the death of a loved one. We celebrate with the Pickard family, Charlie and Donna, as they welcome their new grandson, Noah, into their midst. We pray for them as their role as grandparents, but also for their kids as they receive this great gift of this child in their midst and we pray that you'll equip them with all that they need to inspire and encourage this wonderful child, this gift that you've entrusted to their care. We thank you for Jeannie Mestane in our congregation this day and for the flowers on the platform that remind us of her family, her beloved family here with us and those that we've entrusted into your care. We pray that as we see that beautiful image, that we remind us of the love and encouragement and support we can get from those around us. God, we ask for your peace and for your strength to face all of the situations that life brings. And we ask for those who are caring for others that you would hold them up. Give them that extra measure of what they need to face the tasks and challenges ahead this day. God, we ask that you help us to be the change agents in this world wherever we find ourselves. Give us courage to speak about our faith, to teach those around us about your love for all people and to lead by example, showing and speaking the respect that you call us to for one another. We're grateful that you're not a distant God, but a God who draws near, especially as your people pray. So hear us now as we pray the prayer you taught your disciples saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's thank the chamber singers. Wow. What a gift they have been for us this year. Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Jeff Lindsay, senior pastor here at Meeting House Church. If you're joining us in person, you are most welcome. If you're joining us online, of course, you're most welcome as well. And of course, I remind you, there's spaces here for you when you're ready to come back but we're grateful that we have the technology that welcomes you into our midst. I hope you feel a sense of God's presence wherever you find yourself. We're grateful that as we're winding down the year, there's still lots of fun things that are happening, exciting things, ways that you can get involved in the life of this church. We want you to make sure that you are going to our website because as the website is being renewed almost every day, you get to see uh, our new transformed website, but on that website has all the information for the ways that you can be a part of the life of this church. So please, go there from time to time. And of course, keep watching for the uh, e-news that happens, that comes out on Wednesdays, and also that updates what's happening that week and in the weeks to come. I hope that you all know about this wonderful event that's happening this Wednesday that you're going to want to be a part of. It's called Swing Into Spring. Now, I could say... You should just come be, what's that? What did I say? You see, that seems to rhyme better for me. <laughs> and it was so short a time. Thank you. It takes a village for one senior minister. <laughs> swing into summer. Let's do that. Let's swing into summer. And uh, I could just tell you that there's going to be a 17 pace band that's going to be here. And it's going to be doing some great music for us to dance to. And that'd be worth it to show up just for that. Or I could tell you that we're going to have cheeseburgers and root beer floats. It'd be worth it to show up just for that. But we're also going to have activities for the whole family. And there's going to be some special opportunities for us to bless our mission of the month and to do some special service projects that are going to enhance the life of uh, some of our local ministry partners. And we'll talk about that in a second. So come this Wednesday. Let's close down the year well and look then into spring and into summer. And, uh, and enjoy some fellowship with one with the other. So it would be great. And uh, I, I can't wait to see some of you break out some of your dance moves. So I'll, I'll be here watching. I, I heard it. All right. Yeah. Uh, got a special event for families uh, of all ages uh, today. It's going to be over at the park, uh, right across the parking lot over there. It's got a great name. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to read it so I don't screw it up. Actually, do I have a slide? I don't have a slide for that. It's, uh, it's something about adults going nuts. 
So it's kids at the park and adults go nuts. And uh, I think there's going to be coffee and donuts and there's going to be a chance for you to just have some fellowship. Maybe meet a new friend, uh, but just enjoy our time. And it'll follow this service. So right after the service, if you want to meet some of those young families, just cross the parking lot and join them at the park. Uh, just wanted to give you an update on some of the things that have happened within our missions uh, MRT work. Um, back in March, you might remember we did a big food drive because March is a big food drive month here in Minnesota. This church raised a thousand pounds of food, a thousand pounds of food. And it went to community emergency services and to VEEP, and there were a whole bunch of volunteers that helped come and sort it. And uh, they were very grateful for uh, the effort that you made and the food that helped uh, to deal with some of the uh, critical issues of hunger in our Twin Cities. Uh, then in April, we, uh, we did uh, an opportunity for us to think about uh, issues of housing insecurity and homelessness. And we uh, raised a whole bunch of t-shirts and tennis shoes and all kinds of things uh, that went to a couple of our uh, ministry partners that are working and uh, focusing on, on homeless issues, uh, Avivo and to um, Families Moving Forward. And then this month, we are thinking about community care. How can we uh, support some of the ministries that are doing some specific work, Freedom Works, helping people who are coming out of uh, long-term incarceration and helping them figure out how they can move back into the community. Um, Young Life in North Minneapolis, the work that they are doing to care well for our youth over in North Minneapolis. There's going to be some service projects at our Wednesday night, this Wednesday night event, and it's a chance for you to bless them in some specific ways. They're not going to be hard, they're going to be easy, but they'll go a long way to encouraging our local ministry partners, but also in, in welcoming and encouraging those that they serve. A lot's happening in the life of the church, a lot is inviting you to be a participant of, and we hope you take every advantage of doing that. Some of you know that we've had this thing called this pandemic. Uh, COVID has restricted over the last couple of years some of the things that we've been able to do, especially in terms of the ways we've been able to care well for kids and children and youth ministries. And so we're doing a little catch up. This church has had a longstanding tradition of giving away uh, Bibles to our kids. And so there's going to be a few catch-ups of some of our kids. And I'd like to invite George Dombach to come and tell us all about what that is in blessing our kids. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I love ketchup. I'm more of a mayonnaise guy myself. But um, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> yes, today is a special day. It's our, our Bible milestone. Um, and like Jeff said, this is kind of a, a catch-up. Usually we do it for our second graders. But today it's for our second graders through fifth graders. Um, and we have about 10 other families in the alternative service who are also doing this as well. And then we have uh, other amazing families as well who couldn't be here today, but we have uh, our things for them as well. Uh, so basically our idea behind this is that um, this is an important milestone in, in the lives of our, our kids' lives here at church. Uh, and not just because uh, it's a Bible, right, but because the Bible is a representation of all of us in this community, right? It's a confusing text. There are a lot of big stories in there, but it takes a village, right, to understand those stories, uh, to come to the table, to ask questions, uh, and to dive into, into that book. Um, so for our second through fourth graders, uh, th second through third graders, we have a storybook Bible, the Spark Storybook Bible. Um, and then for our fourth and fifth graders, we have this awesome devotional book that's kind of like a doodle, thought, journal, uh, that can pair with a Bible um, that goes along with that. But a way to kind of get your creativity sparked and ask some questions and work together with your family members, with friends, uh, through some of these stories. So right now, what I would like to do is to invite our families uh, who signed up for our Bible Milestone to come on up to the front here, um, and we'll get to know them. And uh, their caretakers picked out a Bible verse to accompany the day to accompany this celebration. So I'll have you come on up here to the front so we can stand up here together. Uh, we'll go down, you can say your names, uh, and when you say your name, you can read your Bible verse for your child. Awesome. Wait for these friends to come. It's a good looking group, isn't it? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, give them a round of applause. Super, do we wanna start right here? What's your name, buddy? Griffin Moser. 
Griffin Mosier. Awesome. I'm just going to read the verse? Yeah, you can read the verse. The Bible verse we chose for Griffin is Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. My name is Alo Avila. We have selected Micah 6, verse 8. The Lord has shown you what is good. He has told you what he requires of you. You must treat people fairly. You must love others faithfully. And you must be very careful to live the way your God wants you to. All right, and this is, I'm Alicia. And Olivia. Olivia. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. There you go. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth and Siri. Charlie. And we chose, <clears throat> may the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Number 6, 24 through 26. Thank you, friends. Now, we should probably give you your, your Bibles and devotionals, right, to go along with this. So, Jeff, would you mind holding my uh, microphone, please? I've got too many things in my hand. We've got your devotionals, and then there's a little bookmark that our friend Colleen, who also works with us and hangs out with us on Sundays, uh, made for each of you with your Bible verse on the back of that. Um, so, friends, uh, community, let's pray together right now uh, as we bless this day and, and this celebration together. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for the Son. We thank you for your stories, your stories which have the power to help us grow, to guide us, to ask questions, uh, and to build community. We pray that through these books, through your word, uh, that our friends in God's garden will continue to grow and to question, not just by themselves, but with the people that love them and care about them, their families, their friends, their church community here at Meeting House. We ask this in your name, we pray. Amen. Let's give these families a round of applause. And with that, parents and caretakers, you are welcome to go back to your seats. And we're going to go get ready for our God's Garden today. So I'll invite all of our friends in kindergarten, pre-K through fifth grade, to come on up to the front if they'd like to join us for God's Garden. Uh, and because we've been up here for a while and you've heard my voice a lot, we're not going to sing our God's Garden song today right now. But what we're going to do is we're going to say on the count of three, have fun, kids. So church community, let's do that on the count of three. One, two, three. Amazing friends, let's go outside for a God's garden. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jim. That's awesome. What a thrill it is for us to be able to bless and honor and encourage our kids, right? And blessings on all your families as you uh, seek to lead them by the strength and encouragement of the word. We have a chance now to be a blessing to one another. Let's stand and pass the peace that we know from God with one another.
Good morning. I'm called to read the scriptures today, called by Janet Havens. And as Jeff said, it does take a village, and I appreciate our pastors so much. Um, I could go on about that, but I will read today from Acts 9. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the windows, excuse me, all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside and he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. The word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Lord and giver of life, guide us in the way of life, resurrection life, that we might taste of it even now in our own lives and in the life of our community. Be with us now, we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning. morning. It's so good to be here with you, to see all of you. Uh, And even if I can't see you online, it's so good to be able to spend time with you, uh, to share fellowship and hear from God's word. Um, I have my hanky out here just because it's going to happen. Uh, I, tr- I tried to read through it last night to my wife, and I just, I think I cried like three times. All right. Now, as many of you know, um, we're in a series that we started just after Easter titled, The Church on Mission. And uh, we're traveling through the book of Acts. Um, and the book of Acts tells the story or some of the stories, at least, of the early Christian community as it grappled with the explosive event of the resurrection of Jesus. It's the second volume written by Luke, the purported companion of Paul. And one of the things that you notice as you read through this work is that all, all, all the stories that Luke tells gives you a sense that this is a church and a people who are in constant motion, going one place from one place to another. After the event of Pentecost, which begins uh, the book of Acts in chapter 2, where God pours out the Spirit on this small community in Jerusalem, Luke winds up tracing the ministries in particular of Peter and Paul. And you get some really towering stories, stories that have actually sort of seeped in to our culture and to cultures around the world. Stories like the last one, or the one that we heard, I should say, last week, that Jeff preached on, Paul's conversion. 
uh, on the road to Damascus. And uh, sometimes you'll hear, you know, I had a Damascus road experience, which basically means something happened so profound that I was turned or changed. My mind was shifted. My life was maybe turned upside down. Or next week, there's going to be a pretty remarkable story that you're going to hear about. It's the story of Cornelius, a Gentile who nevertheless winds up receiving the promise of God, the Holy Spirit, and embracing the Jesus way. An event that is truly momentous in the development of early Christianity because it means that the church is going to become an intercultural reality made up of Jews and of Gentiles. And then there is our story. Uh, Now, you, you might not know this, but oftentimes when the leadership team gets together and we kind of sit on and decide a sermon series with a theme and we pick out the different passages and we arrange them as to when they're going to be preached, Uh, We, the preachers, or the folks who are on the team, we don't always get to pick our passages. And sometimes they're just assigned to us. And that was certainly the case for me today. And I have to say that initially, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with this passage. Right? What I mean, in a sense, is that this scene with Peter and Tabitha, it's just sort of wedged in a few verses in between Paul's Damascus Road experience, like a mountaintop experience, and then Cornelius, right? The opening up of the church to others, right? Beyond uh, Jews, beyond Israel, to include Gentiles. And even though there's a resurrection that happens in this story, on first glance at least, it doesn't seem to carry the same emotional register as these other stories do. But I have to say, here it comes, (laughs) that I have sat with this story over the last few weeks and I have really found that it 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 is an important story not just for understanding who the early Christians were, but it also offers to us a profound picture of what it means to be church in the world. A picture that I would suggest can be described as follows. The church is called to be a people who practice resurrection. Let me say that again. We are called to be a people who practice resurrection. Practice resurrection, you say. <laughs> what on earth, and I think I have it underlined here on my, task, on, my, on my text here, what on earth could I possibly mean by saying this? Well, let me explain. Now, as I mentioned, our short little vignette occurs in between Paul's conversion and the episode with Cornelius. And geographically speaking, the place where the events that are depicted here in the city of Joppa takes place north of Jerusalem, in a town called Joppa, which is, of course, associated with another figure, and I'll get back to that in just a moment. Now, there's another, even shorter story just before this one. From verses 32 to 35, that story tells us about Peter's healing of a man named Aeneas in the city of Lydda. We don't really get many details about Aeneas, only that he was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. And that his healing, like the the resurrection of Tabitha, leads many to turn to Jesus. And when we turn to our story, we are told that it takes place in the city of Jada, uh, excuse me, Joppa. Now this is a city that's associated with another figure in scripture, Jonah. 
the great prophet who was charged with preaching God's judgment and mercy to the Ninevites or the Gentiles. Luke tells us that there is a woman there in this city. She is described as a disciple of Jesus. And as an aside, this is the only time in all of the New Testament where we find the feminine form of the word disciple. A fact that is certainly a clue to us as to this woman's importance. Here is someone who follows after Jesus, a disciple. We are then given her name, but it comes to us in two different forms. One is in Aramaic and the other in Greek, Tabitha and Dorcas. Both names mean gazelle, a fitting name for a woman of great energy, activity, and service, which as we find out is who Tabitha herself was. Now in distinction from the story about Aeneas, we are told about Tabitha's character as a person and a disciple. We are told that, quote, she was devoted to good works and acts of charity or mercy. This woman, this disciple, showed her love to her neighbors with great alacrity, concentration, through attending to their needs. That Luke offers to us both a Greek and an Aramaic version of her name suggests that she was well known among both Jews and Greeks and that she might have even served both communities and therefore that the widows that we hear about might have come from both communities. Now this extraordinary woman who loved so deeply and who was herself deeply loved has died. Again, we're given a very intimate and unique detail in that regard as we're told that her body was washed and then she was placed in an upper room away from the hustle and bustle of daily life in preparation for her burial. One does not have to leap very far to imagine that this is a community in shock and grief over the loss of this woman. And so when they hear that Peter is nearby in the city of Lydda, they send for him. Now what precisely do they hope to get from Peter? Certainly, comfort in this time of grief. And when Peter arrives, the widows come to Peter and they show him the garments and the other items that Tabitha had made for them, emblems of her love and devotion. And you can almost hear beneath their desire to show their deep affection for this woman, the plaintive cry, why? Why did someone like this die? And what will the loss of this beloved woman mean for our community? Peter does not directly address these unspoken questions. Instead, he puts everyone outside the room and he takes up a posture that he was quite familiar with, one that he'd witnessed from Jesus many times. He prays over the girl, and then he speaks to her using the language of resurrection. Tabitha, arise. And as with the gospel accounts of Jesus, we're not given any sensational details we're not told about power rushing in and lifting her up off the ground or anything like that. 
we're just told in simple language that not only does Tabitha recover, but Peter helps her to stand up. She's then returned to her community, a fact that itself results in many turning to Jesus. Now, those are the facts of the story, the facts of the case, so to speak. But when I say that this story offers to us a concrete description of what it means to be church, which is to be a people who practice resurrection, what is it that I mean? Am I saying that we should be like Peter, and when the opportunity presents itself, we should call upon Jesus to raise people from the dead? Not exactly, though I don't want to rule that out. I would not want to remove that possibility from view, nor do I want to deny that we could focus today on Peter and what he does in his empowering of this woman to resume her ministry. Today, though, what I want to propose to you is that it was Tabitha who had been practicing resurrection long before Peter had ever arrived in Joppa. And that Peter's own act of raising Tabitha up was something of a seal of approval of the resurrection life already at work in her. Now what do I mean by that? I wanna ask a question, and it's a legit question. How many of you before today had heard of the story of Tabitha. Feel free to raise your hand. Man, you guys are great. I, I don't, I'm, it's possible that I had heard this story before, but I had forgotten it if I had, and I certainly did not understand the influence that this story has had in the history of the church. And I can tell you that a quick search of the internet and I would not normally say this, but it cured my ignorance. Saint Tabitha, as she is called in the liturgical churches, has had a profound influence, both in the history of the church and even up to this very day. First and foremost, this little story is the inspiration behind the countless church groups which gather together to make clothing for those in need, whether in sewing groups or knitting groups or otherwise. Churches will often have spaces called Tabitha rooms, which house food and clothing pantries or fresh vegetable stalls or other items. For instance, when I was online curing my ignorance, I found a community in Winthrop, Maine, which had a Tabitha closet, which offered gently used clothing and toys. And I was immediately reminded of what we do here in our own community. We have a Matthews closet, a ministry that was started in partnership with one of our mission partners, Oasis for Youth, which provides clothing for teens in housing transition. And even though Tabitha's name is not evoked or used, the idea of providing clothing to the vulnerable is closely connected to the example of Tabitha. You can also find numerous Tabitha houses. For instance, there's a Tabitha house, Bluefields, located in Nicaragua. And looking on their their website, it says that they provide food, health care, and family support to some of the poorest people in an already impoverished country. Or Tabitha House in Atlanta, Georgia, which was launched out of Traveler's Rest Baptist Church. They have some 137 volunteers who work across the counties that comprise the larger metro Atlanta area in conjunction with local doctors and therapists, social service agencies, schools, and other communities of faith to combat 
sex trafficking and to provide support to the families, women, and girls affected by it. Now what is it that links all of these examples together? And how do they embody practicing resurrection? I think it has to do with the fact that Tabitha made clothing for the vulnerable. In our story, it is the widows whom Tabitha serves. Now, widows were, and frankly still are, an especially vulnerable group of people. Women had little to no rights in the ancient world and little hope of finding work outside the home. And when their husbands died or male caretakers, which is the situation that most found themselves uh, in, they could find themselves in very dire circumstances. As a group, they were constantly challenged with destitution or death, which is, of course, certainly why God shows a very special interest and concern for widows and their treatment in the Hebrew Bible, and why Jesus and the early Christians did the same. But what is it about making clothing that's so important? Why do the widows show Peter the clothing that Tabitha made for them? Well, it has to do with dignity. In the ancient world, clothing and being clothed by another person signified honor and belonging. It was a way of saying, I see you. You belong here with us. You belong with me. You have dignity and you have standing among us. To wear certain kinds of clothing marked a person as belonging to a given community or family. And since clothing was often made within the household, it was also a concrete act of care and love, indicating to the wearer that they had a people, that they belonged. For instance, in the parable of the prodigal son, Jesus tells us that one of the first things that the father who welcomes back his wayward son does is he places a cloak on him. By placing a cloak on his son, the father is not just covering him, he's restoring him as a son, as a member of the family. Conversely, to be stripped of your clothing wasn't just to be made nude, it was to be made naked. It meant being stripped of your dignity, being stripped of your identity. This is why among the many harrowing scenes of Jesus' passion, we read that they strip him of his clothing because crucifixion meant not only death, but a death in which your dignity and your identity as a human being was to be obliterated. Tabitha's act of making, making clothes for these widows then was not just about the utility of making sure that these poor women had clothing to keep them warm or covered. No, it was much, much more than that. It was an act of restoration. It was a way of saying to each and every one of them, I see you. You matter. You are loved by God. You belong. You are a valued member of this community and I am interested in knowing you. It was a means by which Tabitha and her church community could embrace and welcome every person 
who lived among them, a means by which they could tear down the culturally and humanly made walls of division that we often construct to say who matters and who doesn't, who is welcome and who is not. But why is this practicing resurrection? Well, resurrection says and means many different things. It means God's triumph over death. It means God's affirmation of creation and of your body. It means human beings being set free from the dehumanizing powers of sin and death. It means a new world, a new hope, a new life. But among these and many other things, it also means to affirm the dignity and the value and the uniqueness of each person. To be clear, it is God who raises the dead. But we too can participate in God's resurrecting work in the here and now. We too, in our own very human way, can affirm the dignity and the value and the worth of each and every person that we are given the opportunity to serve and to love. We can say through our actions, our words and our endeavors that you matter. You are loved by God. You belong. Tabitha's fashioning of clothing for her community and especially for those who were so vulnerable was just such an affirmation. As I was thinking about this message this week, among the many things that went through my head, I was reminded of when my firstborn son was born, Jonah. Now, during the course of her pregnancy, my wife decided she was going to start knitting. She wanted to make Jonah a sweater, and we looked for that sweater. I was going to pull it out because then I knew I would get like a great response, but I couldn't find it. It took her a while. She had to go back and adjust the knittings. She had to make sure that the pattern was right. And truthfully, Jonah probably only wore that sweater for about four or five months, if that. But as my wife poured herself into making this, she was giving something to her son. She was thinking about the soon appearing person that she had not yet met. She was seeing him even before he was born. She was saying, you matter. You are loved by God. You belong. So, ask yourself this question today. How can I practice resurrection? Who has God placed in my life to whom I can through my actions say, you matter. You are loved by God. You belong. God's invitation to us is to take up the life-giving practice of seeing and affirming others in their humanity. And my prayer is that in a world riven by constant violence and hatred, that we will have the courage to truly become such a people, a community that lives in God's resurrection power so that all are indeed welcome, seen, embraced, and loved. Amen. Let us pray. Living God who sees us 
who loves us and whose longing and will for us is that we will live with you and each other in fellowship. Thank you. You have created us out of love and you have created us for love. Grant to us, therefore, your spirit that we might be truly free to practice resurrection. Living into the love that you have for all people and for the whole inhabited earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
awesome. I, 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 my body was just moving back there. I'm just going to stand here in the midst of you as you pass by. We are so grateful for the generosity that we see every single week as you show up with your gifts and your abilities and your talents and share them so generously with us. That, that is awesome. You know, as we pause and think about generosity in the service, it's an important part of the service. It's an important part where we stop and say, what's my response to what I have realized as I've focused my attention on God and focused my attention on this community? What's my response to that? Not just in this hour, but what's my response in my everyday life? Leaving worship should fill us to overflowing with the generosity because we've remembered, we've received again the generosity of God. God's gracious gifts to us. And it can be something very simple or it can be something very profound, but it's a choice. It's always a choice. You can use all the tools that we offer you. You can give online. You can send us a check. You can drop a little check in the box out in the common. But we invite you to focus your generosity to the world, but focus it here where you are calling your church home so we continue to do the good work you call us to do together and God calls us to do together. So let us pray. God, we pray that you would lead us and guide us in how we respond to your goodness. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and an open mind to receive what you're doing in our midst and around us and through us. Help us to hear that voice that calls us and give us the courage then to follow. Blessings on the generosity of this community and those with generous hearts. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Uh, the choir and uh, the chorale as well as the chamber singers too is that right? I think they're all um, as they're coming forward I do want to note that this is uh, the last Sunday before summer break for the chorale and the chamber singers they have given of themselves they have given of their time um, their talent uh, their focus, their breath they deserve our thanks so let's thank them Also want to recognize uh, Abby uh, Kelly Lanzer. I, I, is she come down? Oh, okay, great. Hey, Abby. Yes, you were our uh, Oregon Scholar for this year. Thank you so much for all of your work. 
And as you're uh, preparing, uh, thinking about what's next, I do want to just let you know that there is a Sunday school class today. We're meeting together again with Dr. Victor Azebo on Crossing the Bridge. So if you want to get coffee, grab some, I see donut holes out there. Get some of those for sure. You're going to need some sugar. And uh, come, feel free to come down unless you're going to head over to the park. It's also a beautiful day. Uh, brothers and sisters, God wants us to be creative. And creative not just in things that we make, but creative in the way that we serve. We're invited to be people who practice resurrection. Let us seek to do that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may you be blessed and go forth in this day. Amen.